A lot of people who live in the West think sagebrush is ubiquitous. It's widespread. Everywhere they travel, they see it. They, you know, they go across northern Nevada or southern Idaho or eastern Oregon. You see sagebrush as far as you can see. So at first glance, when you think of sagebrush, it, it seems like a, a really mundane plant. You know, we have it everywhere. You know, it's all over the western United States, and it doesn't seem that important or that valuable. Uh, but when you start looking at the habitat, the sagebrush habitat, it's more than just sagebrush, and it encompasses this complex system of interaction between the sagebrush, the grasses, the plants, uh, the shrubs and trees. A lot of people don't know what they're missing because what they don't get is that these are incredibly rich, productive systems, and, or they can be anyway. But unfortunately, there's very, very little of that left. You know, we have impacted sagebrush to such an extent over the last century and a half through our settlement patterns, our development, our uh, farming, our grazing bringing in fire, bringing in uh, species, you know, novel species from other parts of the world like cheatgrass. One of the problems that we're faced with here is the encroachment of invasive species. And when you look across this habitat, it seems on its face very healthy. Uh, but a lot of the species that you're seeing here just don't belong here. Um, or haven't traditionally been here. They've been brought in by humans, they've been brought in by cattle and sheep, they've been brought in by other livestock, or they've just been given an opportunity to grow because of uh, the changes that we've made to the natural processes here. Some examples are cheatgrass. You look back in some of these areas and you see wide expanses of cheatgrass or medusa head grass. So for the Upper Columbia Basin uh, Inventory and Monitoring Network, you know, it was an obvious community to pay attention to uh, because so much is gone and yet it is so huge and it supports so many different kinds of life forms. Well we're monitoring in these sagebrush steppe ecosystems to get information on trends over time in the important species both the native and the non-native species and by comparing uh, both native and non-native species uh, in the community we get insight into really the health of these systems. We try and get this monitoring information back into the hands of park managers as quickly as possible so that they are able to make informed decisions about where they should be restoring, uh, where are the areas of these lands, uh, you know, of these parks that are in really good shape, that have been able to sort of maintain uh, the characteristic components, the species, the processes, and things like that, that we really want to try and preserve and protect over time. And then, you know, where are the problem areas? This is a patch of Medusa head that I found maybe two years ago. I'm not sure when it came here, but I hadn't noticed it before. When these things dry out, they will float in the wind and you'll see them bouncing along the surface of the ground. And the park is just over the hill. As it accumulates, you get this biomass that is just thick, that nothing seems to penetrate so that you end up with a monoculture. I mean, in here, we still have a few forbs that are coming up. Eventually, this will be so thick with Medusa head that there is nothing here but Medusa head. And as a result of that, you just lose uh, all sorts of plant species, plus uh, all, of the, all of the insect species, all of the other species that depend upon you know, this, this natural uh, ecotype. And that's the scary part with Medusa head. In the old days, it was simple. You, you tried to keep it uh, exactly the way it was when European man first saw it. But the difficulties in doing that were so overwhelming that, that rather than give up, we changed that, that, those goalposts a little bit. And uh, the whole idea, I think, now of, of building a, or, or maintaining an ecosystem and promoting an ecosystem that's resilient is beginning to become the dominant theme. And I think rightly so. Resilience is a really important concept. It, it gets at this idea of these, the ability of these landscapes to recover after disturbances like fire and drought, for example. We're trying to get insight into the resilience of these landscapes. One of the biggest challenges facing the National Park Service right now and many years in the future is going to be our changing climate. It's changing at a rate that is unprecedented in the historical record, but also the fossil record and the prehistoric record. 
how ready are some of these ecosystems? How able are these ecosystems to adapt to drastic changes that are happening very quickly? So when we think about resilience, we're thinking about ways that we can manage and assist the ecosystem to handle dramatic changes. But monitoring is quite complex because the systems you're trying to monitor are quite complex. And so when you think about this, it's an ecosystem. It's not just a single plant like this blue bunch wheatgrass or the sagebrush behind me. It's a, it's a variety of plants and uh, soils and topographies and elevations. And so how do you look at that complexity and how do you monitor it effectively with a pretty straightforward thing? And that was a tough challenge. What I go out and do is I use a square meter plot that I set out and within that plot I measure the cover of these important components these you know the sagebrush other principal shrubs the the native bunch grasses the non-native invasive grasses we really look at some of just the key factors in sagebrush step there will be teams that will go on for years. You know, the, the idea of this monitoring is it's going to last for decades and decades and decades. The more we understand the resources that we're trying to protect through a program like the Inventory and Monitoring Network, it enables us to not only understand better why we have preserved these places, but will enable us to continue to protect and preserve them for future generations. Places like national parks, to me it's just a travesty to lose them. I mean, we just have so few examples of it. If we can maintain these big native bunch grasses and the sagebrushes, where they naturally occur, it takes a vision that goes out over decades or centuries, and it takes people to make it happen. Then there's the hope that we can actually maintain some of these characteristic uh, aspects of this community. I'm really, really pleased that the Park Service has developed this inventory monitoring program and I'm really pleased that they're investing people and money into doing this.